Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning. I'm Andy Lipman, and I'd like to welcome you to our big picture session on equitable technology. This is one of three such sessions we are holding during this out of lab experience. The others address resiliency and sustainability. They're open to the public and will be accessible afterwards. We see these discussions as basic principles and goals that bind us together as a lab and define our role in society. They focus and give meaning to our research and invention. I hope that like me, you are here to learn. Most of us are devoted to some notion of equity throughout the world and it's expressed by how we work and how we live. When we first worked on the idea of personal computing, we saw it as an equalizer a way to tilt the tables and make more level global access to communications. Others took the idea more physically, for example, Hugh Hare's work on equality of mobility. We now see that as a start, not an end. What we say, how we say it, to whom we speak, and how we act are pieces of that puzzle. And the implications of our actions, both subtle and overt, conscious and subconscious, make real differences. Understanding this in a broad and deep way is critical, both to how we live now and to how we build the world of the future. Cynthia Brazil will lead us on this journey. Over to you, Cynthia. Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia Brazil, Associate Director of the Media Lab and Director of the Personal Robots Group. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our second big picture session on equitable technology. At the Media Lab, we share an acute awareness with many of you of the disquiet inequities that exist in society today, specifically how certain groups of people identified by various characteristics such as race, gender, class, among others, can be systematically disadvantaged over other groups in broad aspects of life. Far too many people still experience prejudice in housing, employment, healthcare, education, criminal justice, and more. And we know that technologies and social technical systems we design can exacerbate this problem. But this doesn't have to be the case. In this 90 minute session, we have an amazing lineup of speakers who shall engage one another in thought provoking conversation. Each conversation explores key issues, challenges and opportunities that will help us to expand how we think about the intersection of design, technology and society. These ideas and reflections both inform and guide our work, indeed are imperative to responsibly and mindfully design technologies that will help enable a future of greater equity for all in the world we build. So to help set the stage, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Caitlin Turner of the Space Enabled Research Group, who will introduce her fabulous conversation partner. Take it away, Caitlin. All right. So welcome everyone. Today, uh, I'm really happy to have Dr. Sharice King with me. Uh, Dr. King is the Neubauer Family Assistant Professor in Linguistics at the University of Chicago. She is an expert sociolinguist and she considers intersectionality and language in her work. She is also an up and coming thought leader and star in the field in considering how race, place, class, gender, and the way that we speak impact our lives and what that all says about us. Um, I've known Dr. King for some time now. We met uh, as graduate students at Stanford University. Um, and I'm really happy to get to interview you today, uh, Sharice, for this event for the Media Lab Members Week. Thanks for being with me. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure <laughs> to bring these conversations forward, you know, that I feel like you and I have had you know, on the side, it's fun to bring it to a larger audience for them to think about. Yeah, like retweet that very hardcore. Um, it definitely seems like one of the things uh, in 2020 is that, which is great, is that a lot of different entities that like weren't really thinking about, um, you know, anti-racism, intersectionality, feminism, and things like that are really starting to consider that like in their work, in their business practices, in their institutions. So yeah, happy to be able to bring this, some of these conversations to, to the big screen, I guess. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask you first about sociolinguistics generally. 
Um, so I think some of our audience probably like generally knows what linguistics is, but wouldn't know the nuances of what it means to be a sociolinguist. Uh, can you talk about, you know, what is sociolinguistics generally? Why do you think it's needed? And what do we learn specifically from sociolinguistics that complements or, you know, is different from other ways of studying people? Yeah, so, okay, great questions. Sociolinguistics is the study of language and identity. And I always like to explain it by sort of posing some of the questions that people may have considered, but uh, never thought about answering themselves. And that is sort of how are we able to describe uh, people based on the way that they speak? How are we able to pick up on particular kinds of characteristics about groups of people uh, based on their speech? So if you hear, uh, you know, a speech signal and you have no idea how this person looks, how is it that you're able to map them to a racial category or to a particular gender identity or be able to guess where they're from or guess their age? Those are kinds of questions that sociolinguists ask. We're interested in, you know, studying accents and dialects and generally the social political consequences, right, of speaking particular kinds of uh, dialects. So that's a general overview of what sociolinguistics is about. In terms of why it is an important field of study and what it can contribute to um, the society <laughs> is that I think it helps us to understand, again, this relationship between language and identity, right? Um, how people are able to construct their identities using language, um, as well as how we perceive different people across different kinds of social dimensions based on the way that they speak. Um, and it helps tells us something about the ways in which these demographic categories, again, are constructed alongside um, other kinds of demographic categories, right? So like, uh, what does it mean to speak as a Black woman in this country? What does it mean to speak um, uh, as a young Latina, right? These are the kinds of questions that I think uh, sociolinguistics can contribute to, to as well as what do we do for speakers who um, are faced with stigma, right, based on the way that they speak, right? What can we do to help ameliorate uh, the circumstances in which people don't understand particular dialects, right? And it is meaningful and impactful for you to be able to uh, understand it. Those are the ways that I think that sociolinguistics becomes important um, for other you know, members of the society to pay attention to. That is a really good overview. Um, I like how you were talking about basically um, the way that people speak um, and how essentially, unfortunately, some types of ways that people speak is essentially stigmatized. Um, how basically if you speak in a stigmatized dialect or stigmatized language, this can have really, um, profound impacts on your life. Um, you know, how the world sort of interacts with you, how people are able to interact with you, how you're perceived. Um, and I wanted to ask you about this phenomenon of linguistic prejudice and about stigmatized dialects generally. Um, so when we're talking about that, like, what does that mean? What does that mean, like, theoretically, pragmatically? Um, and what are examples of, like, perhaps stigmatized dialects of English, for example, that, um, people may be familiar with? Yeah, great question. So when we talk about language prejudice or linguistic prejudice, it is the kind of bias or uh, negative attitudes and stances we have about particular dialects of English or accents of uh, English. And not just English, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me be very clear that linguistic prejudice is uh, a global phenomenon and not something that is just inherent to uh, the United States context. But it's generally uh, when people look down upon the way uh, certain groups of folks speak. And generally, sometimes we like to think that it is about the patterns that people are using, right? Um, well, it just doesn't sound right. Or, you know, I don't understand why they can't just say it like this. But oftentimes, it really represents our feelings about that group of people. Right? And so it's not just necessarily about a person disliking the way um, uh, speech is spoken, but it's also about 
it's also connected to larger ideologies we might have about uh, qualities attached to that group of speakers. Now, examples of stigmatized dialects that I think are becoming more sort of apparent in the wider society in, in terms of talking about it and discussing it more explicitly, have African American vernacular English, which is also um, called uh, African American English or Ebonics, right? These are other sort of instantiations of the name. I think this is one of the most popular ones that people recognize. And you might say, mm, I, I don't think so, Charisse. We see it in hip hop. We see it in, you know, movies. People talk like this and, you know, people especially use it on Twitter as a form or a way of being cool. But um, we have to think about it outside of these contexts of entertainment, right? Um, and think about it in terms of schooling. Think about it in terms of uh, doctor-patient communication, thinking about it in terms of the courtroom, right? Um, and the ways in which uh, that kind of speech is dispreferred in particular contexts, and people are penalized, right? Uh, for a dialect that most, you know, might have grown up speaking, right? It's uh, not necessarily just been a choice of, oh, I'm gonna pick this dialect up when I'm 19. For some people it is, but for others it's that, no, this is the way that people around me talk. It represents where I come from and it represents, you know, my culture or my heritage, right? So that's one example. Another example, I think, uh, is the way that some people sometimes stigmatize Southern English, right? And connect it to these negative ideologies uh, pertaining to people's level of intelligence, right? That's another example uh, of a dialect that uh, can be stigmatized depending on the context and you know I contrast these kinds of dialects against um, ones like British English that have a lot of prestige right across other people um, and are in you know or even maybe European right um, varieties of English <laughs> more right. generally right if someone speech, speaks with a French accent maybe it's looked upon more favorably than say someone um, who speaks with one of these like uh, racialized uh, kinds of dialects such as African-American English or something like maybe Chicano English or Puerto Rican English, right? Um, those would be examples, uh, at least within this context, yeah. Those are great examples. It, I mean, from, you know, what you've just said, it seems like um, there's sort of two things at play. One is that maybe some people don't quite understand that like, you know, a dialect is actually a structure, it's coherent, it has rules, it has, you know, reasons why you would say certain things a certain way versus other things. Um, and people sometimes associate that with, you know, perhaps assimilationist ideas about language and about intelligence, about the fact that, you know, if you're not able to, able to or choosing to speak English in a particular way, that it says something about your inherent value, your inherent competence, your inherent intelligence. Um, and I think this has, you know, clearly a lot of impact in different ways of life, right? Um, I can, like, have an anecdote, which is that, you know, my father, who's, you know, an African-American man, grew up in Western, Southern Virginia, speaking country, Black English, he told a story all the time about how um, he couldn't figure out, you know, he did really well on the math SAT in high school, but did really, really poorly on the verbal. And how that was like such a stigma. He was like, you know, I think, I think that, you know, I was really good at math and I just wasn't good at English. Um, and that I think is an example of how some of these stigmatized dialects, you know, come into play in our society. Like how you were talking about earlier, like, patient doctor communication um, in the criminal justice system and education. Um, it seems like, if I'm correct, that we make, we basically use the way people speak, especially if it's attached to a racial group, to justify all the things that we want to think about that group. Um, yes. Can you talk about, for example, um, some consequences um, that linguistic prejudice has for those speakers in society in socio-technical systems. Yes. Um, I know that, for example, you've had a really high impact famous paper a few years ago talking about the Trayvon Martin case um, and Rachel Jantal as the key witness who was penalized as a result of linguistic prejudice. Um, but feel free to talk about that or anything else you'd like. 
I know yeah. that it's a big subject. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of different directions. Like, you know. um, I'll start here uh, first uh, talking about, um, right? So we talked about linguistic prejudice as being a kind of bias against particular ways of speaking, right? And I think that could yield what we would call uh, linguistic discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. And that is when we act upon that bias, right? And make it such that certain people are maybe denied particular privileges or rights as a result of that. Um, and so I think some of the most famous work on that has come from John Ball, who has looked at uh, a phenomenon he calls linguistic profiling, right? And so he's shown in his research that based on the kind of voice you use when calling for uh, a particular rental property, it can affect whether or not you'll be shown that property or be told that it's still available or not, right? So, you know, he called in these different guises, you know, a Black one, a Latinx one. And the question is, um, is this, yeah, will will the person who I'm speaking to be willing to offer uh, to let me see this place based on the variety that I'm using? And he, he has found that, A, people are able to, first of all, map you to a racial category based on your voice alone, right? Which is really important. And that people are able to make decisions on your behalf about whether or not, right, you uh, deserve the opportunity to see certain areas. I think this also probably happens with respect to, right, jobs. Um, I can easily imagine people, we, we've heard about this kind of discrimination with respect to names, but um, if you don't have the, that kind of information from a name itself, people may use other kind of cues and linguistic ones at that to be able to say, um, yeah, I don't want this person to have access to this opportunity. Now, in terms of my own research and looking at this, um, I worked with John Rickford, who was my mentor in grad school, on a paper looking at Rachel John Tell's speech. And we asked a question about um, how does her speech uh, resemble first the systematicity that we've seen in Black, right, dialects of American English, right? Is she an apt speaker or not? And she very much shows the patterns that we've already show, uh, of seen to be um, rule govern and normalized, right, among Black communities. But in addition to that, you know, there's this question of, is it uh, that people find folks who speak one of these stigmatized dialects less credible? in these kinds of contexts. And that's a really important question because you're uh, rating sort of the truthfulness of a person's speech, not necessarily based on what they're saying, uh, but based on how they say it, right? And I think that's potentially dangerous for us um, considering, um, you know, what Rosa and uh, Flores have called um, the listening subject, right? So this idea that, yes, we can study the patterns of the people who speak the most stigmatized varieties in, um, across the country, but we could also look at how they are perceived by a particular kind of subject, right? Um, and whether or not that subject is going to give uh, the benefit of the doubt or not <laughs> to the speaker based on who they are and what their speech represents in terms of the communities they belong to, right? And so those are just a couple examples of some of the consequences, right, of speaking a stigmatized dialect. Yeah, so what, um strikes me about some of these examples is that the language for example that was used to throw out um you know rachel gentel's testimony was that she was unreliable right it wasn't it had nothing to do with the fact that you know she was speaking a dialect that perhaps the jurors or the transcribers didn't understand um and the fact that that input into the system was simply, you know, labeled as unreliable, perhaps in some unconscious way because she's a Black woman, right? And because of the history of Black folks' experience in the criminal justice system in the United States. Um, and I want to somewhat pivot there to talk a little bit about technology and how these sorts of biased inputs, um, you know, are creating perhaps biased outputs, you know? Yeah. When you have a you know, when you have a speaker, for example, that is not able to be understood by some sort of recognition software, right? Um, yeah. 
and you know what you know what are the sort of philosophically but also pragmatically like the the consequences of having speech that you know is stigmatized or you know prejudiced against not just be labeled as like oh hey there's an error here like i can't understand this uh, you know my, my tech can't understand this but unreliable speaker unreliable witness like not truthful person like unintelligent person all these sort of different like racist classist historical ideas about people are are you know being put into inputs with different yeah, tech right yeah so it's so almost as if it's baked into the technology or baked into the theory right um and that's really important so i, I want to start here Right, when we talk about technology and about innovation, right, we're, we're talking about advancements, we're talking about um, uh, making things better, making things maybe simpler or smoother or, um, you know, whatever kind of goal we might have in the immediate moment. And so when we talk about speech recognition technology, if we go in thinking, oh yeah, this is going to be of a huge help, right, in, you know, these different kinds of ways, um, I don't think that necessarily when we're thinking about creating that technology, we're thinking about who specifically will it help the most and who does this leave out, right? And that's the important question whenever we're in the process of, I think, creating something new and something innovative that we have to ask ourselves is like, who is this especially helping and who might this not be helping? And sometimes we can't see outside of our own experiences to be able to accurately ask that question and answer it, right? And you need people who don't share the same experiences as you to sometimes serve as a critical eye to say, actually, these people are left out of that innovation, right? These people are left out of that experiment. These people are left out of um, sort of that creation. And so when people are sitting down to create, you know, these algorithms or whatnot for doing the kind of transcription work of people's voices, right? Who do you have in the room? And what are you training the uh, algorithms on? You might probably be training it on white speech. And you probably are training it on white speech because that's probably who is most <laughs> reflected in your company in these particular kinds of areas. And if you don't um, pay attention to linguistic diversity, right, um, then it would make sense why that doesn't, your, your, uh, your tools fall, fall short, right? And so I think one of the things that we uh, have to do is to, again, continue to question who's in the room. And you could train your um, machines to do these, right? Or you can, and that's a simple and easy fix. But again, it takes some coaxing, it takes some problematizing in order to get there. And so for me, I guess the number one thing I'd like to see is for people to preemptively say and to ask the question when they're creating sort of these new technologies is, yeah, is there a possibility that we can be reproducing racial inequity or hierarchy when creating this? Right. The way you put that just now, I think, is so key and important, right? Um, I think that sometimes there's this uh, sort of defensiveness or misunderstanding of like, oh, like, you know, my tech didn't create this racial inequity or hierarchy, but the word you used just now was reproduce, right? And, and I think that's the perfect word, right? We're saying that this already exists, right? Linguistic prejudice already exists, linguistic, you know, stigmatization already exists. And so if we don't essentially take care, take very special care and attention to, you know, when creating tech that uses voices and uses speech, um, you know, to take care for that, we will, you know, unintentionally reproduce yeah. the same results. Um, would you say, you know, I think at places like MIT, for example, where a lot of emerging tech, like, is being developed, you know, in places like Cambridge and places like Silicon Valley, um, you know, that in one way or another might use uh, your voice, might use speech as a way of, you know, communicating with another human or, you know, communicating a problem, um, you know, all these different sorts of things. Would you say that, for example, you know, sociolinguistic justice um, 
and equity is, you know, an important frontier for those who, you know, tech designers and tech developers who want to be truly anti-racist and intersectional in their design. Absolutely. I would, because again, um, the way we speak and language is so connected to people's senses of identity and seeing, um, people seeing themselves represented or seeing that their identities don't create a problem for technology, you know, to, you know, I think that's very meaningful for people, right? And I think it's one of those kinds of uh, sociolinguistics or the way a person speaks, it's one of those kinds of things that um, people think is objectively sort of separate from identity, <laughs> right? Like it's one of these things that people think, oh, well, we all start off on, a, on the same playing field. Everybody learns English. Everybody can just choose to, you know, speak this way or not. And uh, the truth is that that could be far, the farthest thing from the truth, right? Um, and it represents, you know, access to certain kinds of, you know, education. And it also represents a certain kind of prioritizing of a way of speech within these, ins across institutions, right? Um, and I think that we have to, like, first grapple with sort of the role of language in the society for helping us to categorize people, right? <laughs> I think that's where we first need to start. And then I think that people who um, are considering technology, especially, again, as it relates to um, things around language and speech, have to have to give get some more awareness just about variation because variation is inherent to language right and like you have to understand the ways that it becomes and how it becomes inherent you know to language that we categorize people based on uh, we categorize people linguistically based on the way we do in the society like of course there are going to be racial differences in language because that is um that is an important sort of um, axis of differentiation within our society, right? And so is gender, and so is class, right? And so it's like, if we know that these kinds of um, partitioning of people, partitions of people, right, like is important to the society, we should always be thinking, okay, what are the very many ways that it shows up? And language is, you know, one of them. Is, I mean, you're right. It seems very intuitive, um, you know, I, and I think yet at the same time, it's something that we don't always question, right? Or we don't always yeah. think about um, unless we are sociolinguists like yourself. <laughs> um, I, so I think that what I want to ask, you know, in this vein of the fact that so many people are paying attention now. So many people are, like, this moment is, is quite historic in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for what would you say to the creators and the designers of tech who want, you know, who want to not reproduce racial hierarchy, who want to create equitable systems around the axes of language and class and race and gender um, and geography? You know, where does one begin? Um, you mentioned like having more people in the room, um, you know, that are going to be representing the diversity of language and the diversity of speech in the U.S. Um, you know, what else do you feel like creators should do to combat inequity in, you know, sociolinguistic representation and access um, in tech? Yeah, I think partly it's also going to be about having different disciplines, right, represented in the room, not just necessarily people who speak different, you know, dialects of English, but people who come from different disciplines, because I think there is a way in which people um, can speak to how bias sort of manifest within, you know, their field, you know, if they're well-versed in that kind of knowledge. And so I think that's another way in which, uh, so like having a linguist in the room, right? <laughs> And can say to people who are maybe not as familiar with uh, linguistics, hey, have you thought about it from this frontier, right, or from this perspective? Um, in terms of what else uh, people who are sort of at the front lines of creating technology can do, um, 
uh, to create this, these new innovations, right, or be innovative without sort of reproducing hierarchy, I think it might help too to go straight to the actual issues that are coming up, right? So if we know that, for example, there is an issue of mistranscription, or if we know there is an issue of, I'm trying to think of one outside of that. Okay, so if we know that people are, you know, discriminating against certain people based on the way that they speak on the phone, right? <laughs> um, how do we create systems that allow people uh, to not have to necessarily um, speak to a person even before they go and see a place so that people can't take those kind of cues and use it to deny people the opportunity to rent that property. May, maybe something like that might be uh, the create, like there's not a one size all fit solution for all kinds of um, um, examples of linguistic prejudice and discrimination. But I think that if we attend specifically to an issue and say, okay, I see that people are now talking about this um, as something that needs to be addressed and create a solution specifically for that, that can be a way of, I think, not reproducing it. In some ways, it's just gonna be like, I'm trying to uh, create something for the entire society and you need other people to come in and say, okay, this serves only a fraction of the society, right? Like that's one kind of solution. And then in another way, you need people to say, this is a problem in the society that we um, see and now we need to create a solution that um, will sort of uh, combat uh, the, the power and the ability one will have to be able to discriminate, right? Sometimes you need to create means to circumvent <laughs> people being able to um, yeah. expose their biases. That's a great point. I mean, sometimes the, I think oftentimes the creators of technology, you know, they don't anticipate uh, that their tech might be used for a purpose that's carceral or, you know, takes surveillance or um, really just like reinforces biases that we already have in society. Um, and so, yeah, that's a great set of, I mean, that's a great set of advice. Um, I have one more question um, for the time that we have. And I want to ask you about broadly considering, you know, the role of linguistics in anti-racism. Um, you know, if we have a racist mindset that would sort of stigmatize speakers of certain languages and certain dialects um, and adjust society accordingly, right, makes it so that people of those uh, different dialects have harder time accessing housing or, you know, being heard and understood, um, what would an anti-racist, you know, sort of mindset around language look like? And how would that manifest and, you know, flourish in society in your mind? Yeah, Ooh, that's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are many parts to it. And Just one I do more. Wanna, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, Anne Charity Hudley, who is a professor in the field who has been working a lot around these issues of uh, racism and linguistics, I think maybe some of the recent work she's been doing would speak to this. Um, but at least from my perspective, um, there are a couple of things that would have to happen in order to sort of enact anti-racism within linguistics. Um, and some of them we talk about, um, John and I talk about in that John Tell paper that uh, we brought up earlier. For one, I think linguists have to be more of the community, right? Like. We can't just be talking to each other. We know that this kind of a bias <laughs> exists, right? <laughs> because we've been studying it and studying people's ideologies, you know, um, around particular groups of people and the way that they speak. Then we have to connect with people and be very interdisciplinary, I think, in terms of um, making sure that we bring to the table this information for people so that they know, right? And I'm glad, I'm grateful that. Um, we are beginning to do that, I think, in terms of the kinds of uh, uh, the kinds of media that we're uh, speaking through. So, you know, like podcasts, like um, op-eds, and uh, among other kinds of things, that's a way to do it. I think that's one way to enact um, anti-racism. Another way is to, again, um, help to create te technology, as we mentioned, um, 
that really takes into account multiple kinds of voices and experiences, right? Um, and, you know, trained speech recognition technology <laughs> to uh, recognize multiple kinds of uh, voices. Another thing that we have to do is to recognize the way in which our theory reproduces hierarchy. What I mean by that, do we have theoretical concepts that, um, that do not showcase, you know, certain groups of people and their full humanity, right? Um, and why are we continuing to use them if they do? And what I mean by that is we need to be sure that when we're theorizing about language and we're theorizing about um, things like language change and, um, yeah, and how, you know, that kind of stuff spreads across communities, we, and when we're theorizing even about African-American speech, that we're not creating a monolith in the process, right? There is a way in which we can talk about the language patterns that sort of become emblematic of a group and why, right? And the, um, again, the socio-political consequences of that. But there's also a way in which we can uh, recognize the full breadth, right, across a group of speakers and how they choose to use language to construct their identities, right? There are many uh, multifaceted, multidimensional selves, right? Um, and so I think that's really important and something that I'm trying to actively work on is to think about the way that um, we study particular marginalized groups and how our study of them is, is a means of empowering them, right? Rather than sort of speaking over them, incorporating them more often into uh, academia, which is a knowledge production enterprise, <laughs> and uh, letting people, you know, define themselves as they see themselves. I think that's also important to enacting, right, um, anti-racism in linguistics. So making sure that we're not reproducing, you know, stereotypes about a group of people, um, yeah, without showing just their full humanity making sure that we're in other rooms and spaces talking about the potential um, stigma they can face. And um, yeah, making sure we communicate more broadly to, uh, to different audiences why it is important to think about the relationship between language and identity. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. King. Uh, <laughs> you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I hope that, you know, those of you like watching this uh, come away with maybe a thought or two about, you know, what you may, and you know, unintentionally or, you know, unintentionally be reproducing or, you know, thinking about how language and equity um, and race and class and gender sort of intersect um, in, you know, in tech um, and in design and in creation. Um, thank you so much, Sharice, yeah, for joining for us. Me. Yeah. Really fun. I always like talking about these things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner and Dr. King, for your poignant and insightful remarks about language, identity, equity, and technology. Next, we have Professor Akene Ijuma who directs the Poetic Justice Group. He is joined by Professor Danielle Wood, director of the Space Enabled Group, and they will continue and expand the conversation with a focus on anti-racism, design and technology, with equity as a core value of their work. Handing it over to you. Hello, Kenny, how are you doing today? So glad to share this conversation with you. And we've just been hearing this a really interesting discussion between uh, Professor King and Dr. Turner. I'm really proud of Dr. Turner and having her as part of my team. Can I start by having both of us explore this topic of, of what equity means to us and how we are thinking about it in our work, especially with regard to anti-racism. Can you share a bit about your thoughts on that? I think we're doing a little bit of sound check to make sure we're getting a connect through clearly. 
Um, but I think uh, we'll just take a moment and I'll continue kind of reflecting on what we've heard so far. We had a great discussion just now with, of course, one key example of what it looks like to address the topic of a dimension of life, in this case, language, uh, that can play a role both in asking who receives stigmas and how we can design to improve it. So we'll be reflecting on that now, but also uh, drawing a Kenny and I together to see how our work relates to it. So we'll double check. Kenny, are you, are you with us now? Yes, I am. Sorry, I had my mic on. Perfect. So glad to hear your voice. <laughs> Let's go back and, and ask your question again. Uh, can you share again your own thoughts on sort of how you approach uh, equity in your work, particularly with regard to anti-racism? Yes, uh, currently we're exploring equity and identity and representation and actually doing all that through language and voice, um, through accounting, which we'll speak more about later. It'll be excellent to hear more about it. Thank you. Yes, accounting is one of the projects I really hope we can explore, particularly as we kind of reflect on what uh, key ideas that I took away from what Professor King and Dr. Turner talked about, the idea that there exists first sort of racial prejudice, I mean, people have ideas about certain languages. So people hold these in our minds and sometimes that gets translated into policies or procedures as well. And then it becomes the idea, I really heard the step that went from prejudice to discrimination. Dr. King was saying, uh, you see language discrimination, that's when actually there's an action taken on the idea that there's an actual bias affecting someone and people can be denied or given opportunities such as access to you know, sort of viewing a rental property, access to uh, sort of better services in different situations. That really stuck out to me as a really concrete way that we see this in society. And I liked how she talked about, uh, we can ask uh, sort of who's going to be helped and who's not going to be helped you know, when a technology or a service is being offered. And I think part of this starts again with asking how do the ideas that sit in people's minds play a role eventually in sort of playing out in society. And it reminds me of something you often remind me when we chat about these topics, which is that one of the things we're missing sometimes is better ideas, right? The question of what would be a different vision for society? We kind of, we heard some of the negative aspects of today's version. And something you often say to me is that you're proposing work that actually would give us a different view of how an anti-racist society could look. Can you share a bit about how you're doing that in accounting? Yeah, thanks. So I think the word I want to use is imagination. Um, in that, you know, we talk about race as being a mirage um, when we're, you know, looking at uh, Dr. Kendi's work. And really that's where our work is is happening in the imagination and expanding people's imaginations on the different possibilities. Um, as far as accounting, when I ask people questions like, how many languages do you think are spoken in the US? <laughs> the responses are in the tens and maybe sometimes you get 100 or 200, but they can't imagine that there's about 1300. And they can't imagine that, you know, 600 over 600 of those 1300 languages are spoken just in New York City. And so even that is a thing, like how can you imagine that someone else could speak <laughs> any other language than the ones that you know is to mean that a lot of languages through discrimination have been oppressed in, in our society. And so in accounting, we're thinking about how we can work towards a form of, uh, I think what um, Dr. King referred to as social, sociolinguistic justice through creating a space for all of these languages to coexist uh, in the same time and space. So what we did was to create um, a work, uh, it, it's a hotline where people can call and count in numbers that they're sufficient and fluent in. And we take those recordings, uh, and we remix them into account to 100 with a different language and a different voice for every number. And we currently have um, over about 80 languages from over 600 people across the US. And that's more languages. We have everything from Amharic to Yoruba. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get closer to that 1300 <laughs> one day. But um, yeah, one of the things that could have happened, speaking about, you know, creating technology that just recreates issues is, uh, you know, most of those languages were English. So if we didn't actually uh, create an algorithm which would take the inverse weight of the languages that were spoken the most, we just hear English most of the time. So we actually had to uh, weight the algorithm actually to select um, the less popular or less spoken languages. 
um, so that those would be heard more. So that's actually one of the things we did to create equity and voices in that work so that we weren't recreating um, the oppressive systems of just hearing English all the time. So thank you for asking that. Yeah, it's a great example of how as part of your design process, you were conscious of the fact that there would be an existing bias, partly by asking who's going to hear about your project, who's going to have uh, the idea that they should call in. And you basically wanted to give a privilege to those that you know might be uh, underrepresented numerically, but also just in even the cultural experience, right? I know sometimes you share this through a museum setting, right? You might have a display at a museum mm -hmm. where people can call the number and you're wondering, well, who's going to walk into the museum versus who's going to hear about this through some other channel? And uh, how have you gotten uh, different responses from people about accounting and how they've reacted to one, deciding to do it, and two, how they feel about the fact that their language is included? So we thought about access and who had access to knowing about the work and also learning about the, um, and just who who had access to speaking the language and, and opportunities to do that. And so actually one of the first things we did was to advertise it on Craigslist. So a lot of our first callers hadn't seen the artwork. They just saw an ad in Craigslist asking them to call and count in their languages. And a lot of people's responses were to say, thank you for creating this opportunity for me to speak my language. Thank you for uh, letting me share what you know my language sounds like. Um, it was a lot of thank you. And then also people shared what we're calling like numerical linguistics, how you count in the language. Some are gendered, some, you know, you have to multiply and et cetera. So, and then also people just simply uh, said where they were from. <laughs> and so it was just good to hear that, um, you know, in the old hotline fashion of like calling in and saying where you're from. It's, it's very nice. I love hearing that. And I really have enjoyed as you share the examples of, you know, quotes you've gotten from the recordings. And I think you're also incorporating this into some of your teaching, right? So uh, you're teaching a class this fall uh, that invites people who are specialists in various topics. And can you share a bit about how you're highlighting several aspects of life? Of course, today we heard about language as one key one, but what are some of the other dimensions of life that you've been addressing to ask how are there anti-racist or uh, sometimes uh, prejudice-based examples, especially across the Black lives? Yeah, so I wanted to think about through the course, we usually tend to focus on um, when, you know, thinking about racism, uh, we usually just tend to focus on the systems, but I wanted to actually talk about throughout everyday activities in life, how these systems affect us. So I broke it down into thinking about, um, instead of saying, uh, talking about reproductive justice, I talk about it in the terms of like birthing what 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 happens actually to black people when in the process of giving birth through that whole process and then after a baby is born what happens to them when they're breathing and these communities are in predominantly uh areas with um disproportionate uh, amounts of air pollution and we talk about eating food uh deserts and apartheid and also swamps as they call them. Um, so we just look at the activities and then from there, I, I think it changes the story and the, the types of questions that you ask. Um, it's so concrete because so. we can then map each of those uh, life experiences that, that everyone has, but can have quite different types of experiences and map them to the kind of outcomes that we know are still disproportionately negative for particularly racial groups, class groups, gender groups, socioeconomic uh, class groups as well, as well as also thinking about uh, topics such as national origin and citizenship status. We can know that there's still disproportionate harm, especially when interacting with socio-technical systems such as uh, the carceral system and the criminal justice system, the education system, access to education and well-being and health. So it's so uh, concrete and so relevant to today's societal needs. People often sort of ask the question, what are these historical problems? And we can say, no, you're looking at mostly current day data and, and highlighting how there's you know, right. ongoing challenges. I've also had a similar experience in trying to teach both graduate students and also lately uh, the member community. So it's been a, a neat fall where I'm teaching simultaneously a class to current graduate students at MIT, their architects, their designers, their engineers and artists. And I'm giving them a lot of historical information about uh, what's happened across the last 500 years of US history and how there's been some of these consistent racist ideas, especially things like certain languages are you know, not as high quality or people from certain groups deserve to work in low income wages because they are naturally good for those kinds of jobs. Especially as you mentioned, Professor Ephraim Kendi's book called Stamp from the Beginning has been our, our core textbook on history. And then we ask the question, if we understand this history, can we translate that into action by designers, by engineers, by scientists uh, who are actually trying to make a difference in technology and innovation? 
And so our class is, is called, uh, based on my team, it's called Can Space Enable Designs Advanced Justice and Development? We made a special version, myself and Dr. Turner, we're particularly uh, drawing these theories together. And just like some of the key uh, suggestions that Professor uh, Sharice King mentioned, the idea of, can we ask the question, can we do a better job of anticipating where we might reproduce uh, negative harms, especially for groups that we know have experienced oppression for many years. And so on October 6th to 9th, I was very proud that Dr. Turner and I offered the first ever member class uh, from the Media Lab to our member communities. I hope some of you who are watching are also on today. And it was a great conversation, right, with people from about 10 different companies, uh, highlighting examples in their own work uh, where they see cases that they could apply this kind of theory to be anti-racist in technology design. And we had discussions first on history, but also on today's situations and what they can see. It was, it was a great opportunity to workshop. And I wanted to uh, turn back to you and ask, uh, what do you see as kind of some of the next steps the Media Lab can take as we try to make this more part of our, our daily work, both for, you know, for our groups, Spetwood Justice and Space Enabled, but also even for our larger community? I mean, I think we're already doing that in our offerings. So through your course, um, both for the members and also for the students through my course, through my seminar that's public. I think these are all great starting resources for us to just expand on. Um, and especially, and yeah, seeing how we can expand that uh, department wide. And how about yourself? Yeah, I agree. I'm very excited. I think we have both um, well prepared in our past work and excited that I think people are really inviting us to join this conversation at the Media Lab level. And we look forward also with, with colleagues. I've had some great chats with some representatives of particular Media Lab member companies and organizations who also find themselves in their own organizations asking, what do they want to do to be anti-racist, both with their, like, their customers or kind of the people they serve, and also how they think about diversity and inclusion inside the organizations. I think these conversations are happening all around us. And uh, one opportunity I'm really thankful for, uh, myself and Dr. Turner recently won a grant from the National Science Foundation, just another example of the fact that there are opportunities to engage both as scholarly research as well as very practical kind of outcomes. Uh, looking at topics of innovation, and we're going to compare two cities, in this case, Boston and Detroit. These are examples where we can say, uh, what do we, we actually have uh, the kind of prejudice that we heard about from Dr. King, both in language, but also even in our idea about who's innovative. Meaning we think of a city like Boston, and we say, oh yes, it's a place that's known for innovation. Uh, we think of it as having, they often say Kindle Square, right, has the highest per capita innovation uh, in the area. But when we look at other regions of the world, we can say, do we see a respect for innovation in different cultures? So cities that are predominantly black, like Detroit and Cleveland, we're gonna explore what innovation looks like in those settings and uh, see how it can be different, how it can be, uh, maybe have different cultural practices, but can still be effective. And so I look forward to kind of sharing that with you in the community. And uh, we can ask how we can have more folks uh, as part of this dialogue, both in the Media Lab member community and in our student and faculty and staff community. Wow, uh, first, that's amazing. Again, congratulations on all that work. Um, yeah, I think, sorry, can, can you ask what the question was again? I think now we can think about wrapping up. We're about one minute left. Maybe one thing you can do okay. is share some of the ideas you and I have been talking about with regard to what we can do next to kind of bring this uh, more to the community. And we can give a clue uh, to the community that uh, we're coming out with an idea for a new initiative, kind of building on the dialogue we've been having. You wanna share a bit about that uh, and just give a preview of what's coming up in the next uh, few months. <laughs> give a preview without saying everything, sure. Um, yeah, so between the two of us working across design and technology, we've been thinking about how we can expand uh, on our projects in anti-racist research, um, thinking just about what that looks like um, and, and how we can share this um, with other initiatives and other faculty and other labs and just to create a space for this conversation to really be focused on. I'm so excited to do that work with you. I think we saw some of the ingredients today, right? Part of it is drawing from experts like Professor King and other professors who are really deep in particular aspects of anti-racist theory. And then part of it is asking how the community of designers and makers and creators inside the Media Lab can make it part of our normal practice, right? To understand historical realities, uh, to understand sort of current trends, and then to use that as part of our active process so we don't reproduce, but instead we envision, as you're doing, an anti-racist future. So thanks for joining me in that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Danielle and Akene, both for your inspiring ideas and for your leadership in helping the Media Lab and our members advance our work and our conversation. 
in anti-racist technology design and practice. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Kong. He directs the Community Biotechnology Initiative. He will be joined by Rear Admiral Susan Blumenthal, who we are fortunate to have with us as a visiting professor and who served as the former US Assistant Surgeon General. This dynamic duo will turn our conversation to designing more equitable healthcare technologies and systems, democratizing biotechnology and access, and ensuring a more inclusive scientific and health leadership. Take it away. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And again, my name is David Sun Kong, and I direct the Community Biotechnology Initiative at the Media Lab. And I really want to acknowledge and thank uh, Caitlin, Charisse, Danielle, and Ekene for their really thoughtful conversation on sociolinguistics and anti-racism. And really excited to shift now to this topic of equity as it relates to healthcare, the life sciences, and biotechnology. And so again, it's a real honor to introduce Rear Admiral Susan Blumenthal, MD. Uh, she's a former U.S. Assistant Surgeon General and currently, again, visiting professor at the Media Lab. So we're so uh, thrilled and privileged to have you, Susan. And uh, Dr. Blumenthal has had more than two decades of service as a senior government health leader under four U.S. presidents. Um, so, so again, Susan has had just a tremendous career in public service and public health. And it's such an honor to have you and to really join you this, uh, in this conversation. Thanks so much, David. What a, what a pleasure to be here today. Wonderful. And so to start, I think, you know, again, just just thinking about um, the disparities that we do see in society as they connect to healthcare. I wonder if you could start by just outlining what some of those are and really thinking in particular about um, COVID-19 and the pandemic and so how some of these inequities have really been laid bare um, and are now in a way even more exacerbated. So I wonder if you could start by just uh, outlining some of those disparities for us. Absolutely. Uh, well. COVID-19 has crippled the US economy. It's compromised the health of our nation and, and exposed the shameful health disparities that negatively affect people of color and those living in poverty that had been there really all too long. Uh, communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The death rates for blacks and Hispanics are twice as high as whites and they're being hospitalized over four times at the rate as compared uh, to uh, Caucasian Americans. Um, you know, the uh, this is just, as I said, exposed something that um, we've, we've known and that has existed historically, that, um, that uh, Blacks have had higher death rates from heart disease, from diabetes, from stroke, from AIDS, um, and have been neglected in terms of being included in research studies uh, in America. Um, COVID, I think these reflect, as has been discussed already this morning, underlying conditions, socioeconomic factors, increased exposure to the virus because of being frontline communities of occupation and lack, lack of access to healthcare. Um, you know, additionally, Blacks have had worse outcomes and incidences from, from other diseases. And um, African-American women have higher, higher maternal mortality three times as high as white mothers do. And again, there are issues of institutional racism uh, in society and in the healthcare system um, where women have either not been picked up or have lack uh, of access to prenatal care. And for me, uh, I served, I had the honor of serving as the country's first deputy assistant secretary for women's health and was active in the 90s in exposing the inequities uh, for, for women. Uh, women uh, were not included in clinical trials for uh, diseases like heart disease or lung cancer or AIDS. Um, when we trained uh, a generation of scientists and physicians, we didn't look at sex differences. And uh, being a woman was a, considered to be a pre-existing condition when it came to health insurance. Women were, were actually charged more than men prior to the Affordable Care Act. Um, this changed in terms of uh, really a revolution in trying to get women uh, on the, at the front burner of our nation's healthcare agenda to ensure that they were included in clinical trials. Um, when it comes to healthcare coverage, I think this is a major issue related to, to disparities. Um, you know, uh, 26 million Americans uh, do not have health insurance. And prior to the Affordable Care Act, people of color were significantly more likely to be uninsured than whites and had limited access to affordable healthcare coverage options. And more likely to live in low-income families without coverage uh, that was offered by an employer and had difficulty affording private coverage when available. 
Um, now, fast forward in 2017, still 11% of African Americans are uninsured compared to 6% of non-Hispanic whites. Uh, and in 2017, 18% of Hispanics were uninsured compared to 6% of non-Hispanic whites. Um, I think many people of color uh, have to also go to poor healthcare facilities or there may be fewer healthcare providers where they live. And again, these kinds of structural barriers to, to getting healthcare, longer wait times for appointments or transportation or childcare issues, um, and the stereotyping that has occurred by providers or language barriers that may occur in the healthcare system. These barriers rest on a shameful history of uh, mistrust in research and medicine, for example, see uh, in the past um, the Tuskegee studies or Henrietta Lacks uh, in terms of not being informed that her stem cells were being used in research. Um, Finally, there's been, a, as I said, a lack of inclusion of women and people of color in clinical trials in the past. So Susan, that's a, a really significant list of obstacles. <laughs> and so uh, really, I'm, I'm excited to hear more about um, ultimately what are some of the strategies of, strategies that we can um, use to really overcome this. And I know recently you had uh, written a wonderful piece in CNN about this idea for a, a public health new deal. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, th thank you, David. Yes, there, there, there are solutions and we must move quickly and rapidly to address these inequities. Um, I, I think our, our country urgently needs a public health New Deal modeled on the framework of the New Deal, which, as you know, is a series of public projects and social and economic reforms that were enacted by President Franklin Roosevelt in response to the Great Depression. So the guiding principle of a public health New Deal would be an all government approach that is comprehensive and integrated across federal, state, and local agencies with an emphasis on prevention and preparedness, uh, because we weren't prepared when it came to COVID-19, as well as addressing the many social, economic, and environmental factors that contribute uh, to health. Um, in light of the devastation that the pandemic has wrecked, uh, wreak on our, our country, it's urgent that we invest in public health, that we modernize our public health infrastructure to better detect and prevent the spread of infectious and chronic diseases, to redesign America's healthcare system for equity as well as effectiveness, and to collaborate across multiple sectors of society. It's the intersectionality that previous speakers have talked about that's needed uh, that really addresses the basic needs of Americans such as economic security, educational opportunity, affordable um, you know, community safety, healthy food, and, and access to health care. Uh, because you know, um, health is not in the view of a clinic or a hall. You're going, to send, you're going to treat that patient and send them back out. And if they don't have housing or food uh, or insurance to come back in, um, you know, that, that medical intervention is not going to be helpful. So there's, it really requires this sort of um, mobilization of all sectors of society to improve health and to address equity. Wonderful. I, I certainly find that a really compelling vision myself, and hopefully we can get uh, traction for this in our, in our federal government. Um, and so I want to shift and talk a little bit now about technology. Um, this is something that you and I've talked quite a bit about and different ways that technology can both help or hinder in rectifying some of these disparities. Uh, in particular, um, Beat the Virus was a, um, an initiative that you and I were both involved in um, earlier on in the pandemic. So I was wondering if you could just spend a moment and uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, let me let me just say that there are a number of things that hinder with, you know, have hindered with technology. Um, for example, some of the algorithms are outdated and, and based on, on whites. Uh, one used in U.S. hospitals to allocate health care to patients has been systemically discriminating against Black people. Uh, there was a study just published in Science uh, last month that said that the algorithm was less likely to refer Blacks than whites who were equally sick to programs that aim to improve care for patients with complex medical needs. Our data systems, we saw this with COVID-19, are not collecting and reporting on racial ethnic differences in real time. So we need to change that as well. And then in terms of smartphone use, Blacks and Hispanics are more likely than whites to rely on their smartphones for a number of activities, such as seeking health information. Um, but uh, when it comes to broadband access, 
um, whites are more likely than either blacks or Hispanics to report having a broadband connection at home. And that means that a lack of broadband internet connection, particularly now during this COVID pandemic, is associated with fewer telehealth visits and it's hampering patients' use of their medical records to communicate with their healthcare professionals. So we really do need to modernize um, our healthcare system with technology. Public health has not used it uh, in the ways that it should, and we need to modernize our federal programs. Like for example, WIC, and I've been working with the MIT Media Lab to do this, 53% uh, of our nation's infants are enrolled in this federal food assistance programs for mothers and babies. It's used paper vouchers in the past, but why shouldn't we in the digital age you know, have a EBT card paired with an app that allows people to shop more effectively, to register uh, for the program, and to interrelate with Medicaid enrollment and SNAP enrollment so that we really have, you know, a more seamless system of access to life-saving government benefits. Now, David, you mentioned Beat the Virus. Um, Beat the Virus is a, is a wonderful initiative of um, the MIT Media Lab, uh, New America, and uh, McKinsey and other uh, uh, partners of, of the lab. Um, the idea was when the COVID pandemic hit, uh, there was really not a lot of trusted information out there uh, to communicate to people about proven public health messages. And uh, Beat the Virus is a new initiative uh, uh, on the web that is really targeting uh, a range of people using influencers. We've, we've um, We've expanded this to Health Pulse, recently launched by the MIT Media Lab. Um, it's going into the Atlanta metro community to figure out how to message uh, proven public health practices like mask wearing and social distancing and, and proper hygiene to a range of populations, particularly to people of color living in the region who are not only bombarded with COVID, but with an infodemic of misinformation about how to address the pandemic. So I uh, have, uh, you know, continue uh, to uh, work on these projects and am very proud of the work of the MIT Media Lab uh, to address them. Okay, wonderful. And just a, a quick final question here. Uh, we've only got about three minutes or so left, but um, could you quickly talk about um, the role that leadership plays in improving equity? Well, I think leadership is 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 a cornerstone. Um, for all too long, women and people of color have been underrepresented as leaders in the health professions and and, and the scientific fields. Um, only ten women deans in our of our nation's medical uh, professions. Only twenty percent of full tenured professors are women, and many fewer uh, people of color. Um, being a leader means that you help to set priorities, uh, working with your team. You are involved with hiring decisions. Uh, setting issues that are important and, and changing the culture of institutions. So while, for example, entering medical students are now 50% women and a high proportion, um, you know, still still underrepresented, but more uh, coming in of people, uh, students of color, um, we have to do better. And, and as we do, making sure that that cohort uh, is able to move into leadership positions. Um, there have been many roadblocks, structural barriers for all too long, and this must change. Okay, great. So David, thank you. Thank you. Well, David, I'm wondering if I could ask you some questions now. Um, you know, you have done such extraordinarily important uh, work with the Community Biotechnology Initiative at the lab, and, and I'm wondering how we could create greater access and participation in the life sciences and biotechnology from diverse communities all around the world. Uh, might you comment on that, David? Yeah, thanks so much for the question, Susan. And, and I think, um, you know, that question of, of who ultimately is at the table, who are the participants, who are the agents in change that can really help shape the future of the life sciences and biotechnology is really critical to the work of our initiative. And so I feel like there are a couple of key dimensions there. Uh, one part is really the tools themselves, right? Um, in, in life sciences, as you know, um, there's a lot of infrastructure required and a lot of the tooling and so on is very expensive and, and hard to access. Um, we've got colleagues all around the world in Latin America, Africa, et cetera, that, um, you know, if their PCR machine breaks, you know, nobody's kind of come from Germany to come and fix their machine. So I'm um, having uh, these open source tools is really important. So a big part of uh, the work in our lab involves 
tool building. So for example, we've built this uh, very low cost, uh, what's called a DNA electroporator, which is normally a technology that's thousands of dollars for um, basically putting DNA uh, into cells. It's a very uh, foundational tool. And we figured out how to make a very low cost version of it that you can basically fabricate by hacking a fly swatter, which is a globally available um, high voltage source. So uh, that's an example of one tool. And then we've done a lot of work around, around movement building. So ultimately uh, bringing in uh, community organizing practices into thinking about how to crystallize this global network of what we call community biology labs. So these are folks all around the world that are not part of institutions like academic institutions, corporations, or governments, but that are really excited about grassroots and community-driven life sciences. So um, we've really been doing a lot of intentional work around movement building. And then finally, learning and education, of course, is a really critical thing. So um, I've been working with colleagues like Professor George Church, uh, Professor Joe Jacobson, and other faculty all around the world to teach a class called How to Grow Almost Anything, where we basically teach kind of uh, the frontiers of synthetic biology. Every single week, uh, the students learn a new topic and a new skill. And over the course of these weeks, they ultimately have the kind of aggregate abilities to quote unquote, grow almost anything. And so this has been a really neat course that we've taught globally for the past five years or so, and um, has been really a tremendous joy and, and a lot of fun. Well, I, I thank you so much. I mean, I think it's really made a, a real difference. Um, you know, David, over the past three years, you've organized an important event at the Media Lab called the Global Community Bio Summit. Can you tell us more about that uh, very innovative initiative? Sure. Um, and so this event, I think, is really a big part of the, the kind of the tip of the spear of this larger movement building effort, which really, again, is about collective intelligence, collective creativity, and really thinking about the global network of these folks that are working in these community driven uh, spaces. And so we've worked closely with folks like Marshall Gans from the Harvard Kennedy School to really think very deliberately, intentionally about how to bring these community organizing and movement building tactics and marry them with these life science nerds, essentially. And so um, this year was our, our fourth annual Bio Summit. We had more than 650 participants from 61 countries all around the world. Um, we had uh, numerous uh, tracks like diversity and inclusion, the power of community, open innovation, guardianship of ecosystems, and so on. And I'm really proud of the fact that we were able to highlight and lift up the voices of indigenous leaders, folks that um, have really been thinking very deeply about how to live with nature and living systems. Um, every single morning, we had keynote speakers featuring uh, women of color, and um, really, I think, have been focused very intentionally as well on the global south, so Africa, Latin America, and ensuring we have very strong participation there. And so um, the event, I thought this year, I was really proud of it. Um, we used a lot of different types of digital tools to augment the, um, the human connection and authentic ways in which we could build community together. And in our closing session, you know, we really had, you know, participants were in tears, were talking about how meaningful the event was for them, uh, despite it being a virtual setting. So I think that's another really exciting research thrust for the future is thinking about how digital tools and other frameworks can really enhance this type of human connection and authentic community and movement building. And so, uh, you know, at the end, we, we surveyed our participants, 50% um, of them said it was the, the best virtual event that, that they'd ever been to. And a quarter also said it was better than in-person events that they'd been to. And we had about 60% of our respondents say that they wanted to join the organizing team afterwards. So, um, so we're really proud of, of that work and um, really believe that um, this larger kind of initiative around movement building, bringing in these communities that are not normally at the table, uh, both uh, within settings like the United States, but also around the world is so critically important to equity um, in the life sciences and in synthetic biology and biotech. Um, so uh, anyways, um, we are over timed and Dr. Blumenthal, I really just wanna thank you so, so much for taking your time and sharing um, your insights with us. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Cynthia right now to uh, conclude this session with a topic on um, artificial intelligence and equity. So thank you so much, Cynthia. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kong and Dr. Blumenthal. Your conversation was both sobering and offering many reasons to have optimism around greater equity in healthcare, biotechnology, and importantly, inclusive leadership and, and community. So thank you so much. In our final conversation, I am joined by Dr. Kate Darling, who brings her deep expertise in law, ethics, and policy to discuss the broad societal impact and implications for equity in the face of a highly disruptive technology artificial intelligence. So Kate, <laughs> we are living in the era of artificial intelligence. We say, uh, see AI powered technologies rapidly proliferating. They're disrupting many industries and aspects of professional and private life. Um, help us set the stage for this conversation. Uh, take a moment and talk through how you see some of the opportunities and challenges and how AI is shaping our institutions, 
the workplace and human behavior. Is AI helping or hurting equity in society? Well, first off, let me just say that I think that the most common concern that is um, in the media and in a lot of casual conversation around artificial intelligence and robotics is that these technologies are coming to replace us. There's a lot of conversation about how we're gonna automate away our workforce, how there might be mass unemployment. There's also a lot of conversation about you know, robots replacing our teachers or our sex partners. And while these are really understandable concerns against the backdrop of kind of broader economic anxiety, they do tend to overshadow, I think, sometimes some of what, you know, we view as more urgent issues in AI or with AI. So in particular, some of the things we've already uh, heard about in this session today, how technology can reproduce or even exacerbate inequity and harm. Um, you know, we heard about linguistics examples. We heard about healthcare examples. We're also currently dealing with things like search algorithms that reinforce racial and gender biases. We have virtual assistants that respond quite poorly to, you know, uh, mental or physical health crises. We have AI in the criminal justice system um, issuing unfair risk, risk scores in courtrooms. Uh, mm -hmm. We have hiring algorithms that put um, certain job candidates from, from specific demographics at a severe disadvantage. So this is all happening right now in front of us. And it's why the work of the amazing folk we just heard from in this session is, is such important work. Um, but on the robots and jobs concern, I wanted to point out that that is also about equity in ways that we sometimes don't talk about in the media. Um, economists love to debate whether <laughs> artificial intelligence is going to take massive amounts of jobs away or whether it's going to spur productivity and growth in a way that creates jobs. And I, I think it's the latter, um, but also <laughs> Peter Fraze points out in his novel For Futures um, that even if you believe that automation doesn't kill jobs, this is the kind of argument that can only be made from a great academic height while ignoring the pain and the disruption costs to the actual workers who are displaced. And so we really should be asking who reaps the benefits of these new technologies, who bears the burdens. And we also need to understand that there are different ways to think about things like labor. Um, to me, one of the biggest problems with the very pervasive idea that artificial intelligence you know, can, should, and will replace humans is that it lends itself to this technological determinism, this assumption about what the technology is for that obscures that we have a lot of choices in how we design and build and integrate these technologies. So for example, um, you can, as I've seen many companies do, <laughs> ask the question, you know, we automate our processes little by little um, to get rid of these pesky expensive humans in the pursuit of short-term profit. Uh, or you can ask, how could we use technology as a supplemental tool to help people do a better job so to think more creatively about how to support workers instead of automate them away. Um, now, these choices that we have about how we build and use the tech go beyond just workplace automation. There are a lot of researchers um, that are trying to actively build technology uh, that supports people in their goals. So I think that at the same time that we try to address these inequity issues head on, we can also be leaning into some of the positive ways that we can use AI to support human flourishing. And, and I see a lot of that in your work, Cynthia. I mean, you've obviously you know, spent many decades thinking about ways that AI can support people in, for example, in health and education. Isn't that right? Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah, so, you know, when I think about particularly the the intersection of my own work and AI and equity, um, you know, we've been spending um, quite a lot of time over the past six or eight years really looking at how do we help uh, enable a higher quality, more accessible early childhood education. So in the United States, we don't have a national uh, preschool program. And you know you can actually track language and literacy uh, rates and development, where we know that you know roughly only uh, forty percent of children in the United States attend a high quality preschool program, and that turns out to be highly predictive of kids who are reading at grade level in the third grade, which is highly predictive of kids who read at grade level in the eighth grade, which is predictive of how they do in high school. So right now we don't really realize it, I think, but in the United States, our graduating twelfth graders 
only 40% read proficiently. That means deep critical thinking, reflective thought on what you read. Now, can you imagine a single scientist or engineer, we talk about all these amazing jobs, if you can't read proficiently, right? So when I think about, you know, if there's one area, <laughs> I can create a different kind of technology that can really help address this issue of inequity in education, it's early childhood. But of course, young children learn differently than when we're older and maybe we can sit behind a computer and type and mouse and read and so forth, right? So young children learn through play, they learn through social interaction, we know that their peers, their family plays a critical role in that. So to your point about how do we design these systems, we are not designing robots to replace teachers or parents at all. We are thinking deeply about how do you create a socially and emotionally engaging technology, in this case, it's a social robot, who can participate in the kinds of critical, rich interactions that children need to learn that welcome and include and support teachers and parents in that process because they are key, key stakeholders. And so we can, you know, it's a choice, you know, are you trying to say we can, you know, automate private tutoring, et cetera, et cetera, or you can say, what do people really need to be able to be successful and to flourish and to make sure that parents and teachers are playing the critical role they need in their children's education and really trying to think about deeply how do you design technology to support that. You know, another group we've been thinking quite a lot about is older adults, right? So, you know, we talk to people who are, you know, in, in the elder care uh, workplace and they say, we literally cannot build enough assisted living facilities to meet the silver tsunami over the next couple of decades. It's growing demand. They're, you know, they basically say people have to age in place and they have to be able to do it much more independently than we do now. We literally cannot train enough doctors and nurses to meet that demand. And in fact, when you look at particularly the nursing profession, the work is so difficult, you know, emotionally challenging and underpaid that once you train nurses, they actually leave the field. So this is, I think, another critical area where the right kind of what I like to call high touch technology can come in to really help bridge this gap. How do you design it to empower, in this case, older adults, maybe their health or clinical staff and their extended family to help them age with dignity and independence where we really take, I think, a, a more humble approach to say we need to engage these stakeholders as, as co-designers of these solutions. We can't just like go in our lab and build it and lob it over to them and hope they use it and it's great. We know that never works in fact. So, you know, in, in my group, you know, we have, you know, a big effort and really thinking about new ways of doing participatory design to be able to create new tools, actually, that allow even older adults to not only, you know, experience and live with a social robot over an extended period of time, but even to program it. Because the deeper you can engage them, the deeper they can imagine and design and think about in the context of their life, the better we're going to be able to create something that's going to really make a difference. So I see huge opportunities, right, in AI around, you know, particularly bridging this gap, you know, this continuity of care and support from our institutions, such as our homes and, and such as our, you know, uh, schools and our hospitals to the home, which is really critical. And, um, you know, being able to do that in a scalable, affordable way, but, but we know we have to do it right. <laughs> so, Kate, <laughs> we know this is not just a technical challenge. You know, we need to really understand how to design these technologies ethically and responsibly. This is a new kind of technology to support our human values and relationships. We know these kinds of technologies can be very socially and emotionally persuasive, for instance. They can, they, they can shape behavior and attitudes both to help people or potentially to manipulate people. We just, we know that's, that's what this technology is capable of. And we know that sometimes our best intentions, you know, can have unintended consequences, right? So I know you've thought a lot about this, you know, from an ethics and policy perspective. Um, so what path do you see helping us move forward um, to more equitable, responsible AI? Well, it's a good question and I could 
talk for two hours because I do think there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of different things we can do. There's, you know, changing how we design the technology. Like you were talking about having more participatory design and having, you know, the question of who designs the technology is also a big one. Um, but there's also like more broadly than just the people building the technology, a lot that all of us can do at every level. Um, you know, even just at the local political or regulatory level, we can be pushing to ban known problematic uses of technology like facial recognition. Uh, we can be pushing for economic and political systems that set the right incentives for companies to think beyond short-term profit goals. Uh, and another thing that we can all do, something that I'm very interested in is reframing how we think about artificial intelligence. So for example, we love to compare artificial intelligence to human intelligence. And I just wrote a book that comes out next year that's all about how this analogy actually limits us and <laughs> is in some ways misleading and gives the technology too much agency. So just one tiny example of that is responsibility for some of the harms that we've been talking about in this session. You know, when people say, oh, the algorithm made a decision that we couldn't possibly anticipate, you know, we didn't you know, make it racist. Um, you know, I already see companies and governments kind of pointing fingers at the system and saying, well, it can make autonomous decisions and learn. So how are we supposed to anticipate this outcome? It's not our fault. Um, and people are saying that the solution to this problem is to make the machines themselves more equitable, to program them to be fair and make the data sets they're trained on unbiased, et cetera. And well, there are a lot of problems with that being our only approach. Like, yes, that's great that we are trying to do that, but um, for example, we know from the field of machine ethics that it's not actually possible to program human ethics into machines. Mm -hmm. uh, but what if instead of thinking about artificial intelligence as human intelligence and human decision-making, we compared these systems to animals? <laughs> animals can also sense and think, make autonomous decisions and learn, but we don't expect them to follow our moral codes or ethics or laws. You know, Trying to make the machines fair isn't always the right approach. If you, as an individual or an, or an organization, set a tiger loose on the street, you know you don't get to point your finger at the tiger and say, "Oh, I couldn't anticipate it was going to hurt people. I trained it to be really nice." So, now of course there are a lot of differences between AI and animals, but the point is that using this different analogy suddenly makes assigning agency and responsibility feel really different, and it makes us think. Also, importantly, it makes us think more deeply about whether it is appropriate to use AI in every situation that we are using it today. You know, maybe you can train a tiger to safely do circus tricks, but maybe it shouldn't be in a position where it can make decisions about human lives. So that's just one small example about how rethinking some of our assumptions about technology can help us see more choices that we do have. And it's so important for us to understand uh, the limitations of the technology, but also the capabilities of the technology, the potential, so that instead of just succumbing to this idea mm -hmm. that we're gonna automate human skill and decision-making, we can be very clear-eyed about where it's appropriate to use these tools. And now I'm, I'm four months pregnant and with my second, so I'm thinking a lot about future generations, which is why I'm so interested in, in your group's work around children and um, a huge component of shaping our futures is education. And I'm so excited about some of the AI literacy work that you've been doing recently. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about those efforts because I think they're really key to answering the question you just posed, which is what do we do? How do we change the future? Yeah, well, thank, thank you for that question. So, you know, we've been doing all this work, bringing in these advanced AI technologies to young children, to older adults, you know, and everyone in between. And as time has gone on, of course, they see these technologies as, as magical and engaging. And, and especially for kids, it was clear that they don't understand how this works, and yet they are using it every day. You know, it's in Snapchat, it's in social media. You know, as we talked about, it can shape attitudes and behaviors. And um, it just really dawned on us that, you know, children today aren't just digital natives, they're AI natives. They're growing up with this technology. And it's not enough to educate people to be digitally literate. They need to be AI literate, you know, because these advanced algorithms are going into everything, you know. So now we think a lot about how do we, you know, so much of AI education happens at the university level, right? You know, and so now we're thinking about what about AI education for the rest of us, literally for everyone else, where we need to create a society where people understand these technologies enough that they don't get whipped around by the kind of hype in the media cycle. They understand it enough that they can be responsible users of these technologies. 
They can participate in the democratic process around these kinds of technologies, like you mentioned. And of course, so that we can help educate and prepare a far more diverse and inclusive generation of ethical AI designers. So, you know, I've been leading an effort, you know, it started within my group, and now across all of MIT, where we're, we, you know, it's in the constructionist tradition, of course, you know, it's hands-on and project-based, but we, we call it responsible AI for computational action, where we're not only teaching kids about computational thinking, we're not only teaching kids about AI, we're also teaching them about ethical design practices and how to think through social societal implications with positive and negative. And then we help them think about how they apply those ideas to their own projects framed as, you know, what can I make using AI that can actually have a positive impact in the world? So we're taking these child-friendly coding platforms, we're adding these, you know, really actually pretty powerful AI tools so kids can make things with AI in, in, in some cases deploy things <laughs> that other people can use. So, you know, I think there's there's this time now where we can we can think about empowering kids in a way where they can they can feel they're really making a difference. And I think it's really important, especially now, that kids feel they can make a, a real meaningful difference. And we are intentionally thinking a lot about how do we reach you know underserved kids? How can we go out into Title I schools? This summer, we literally did you know a bunch of virtual workshops, recruiting from Title I schools, teaching you know hundreds of hours. Um, of AI literacy and ethics curriculum training teachers, I am blown away at how creative and thoughtful these kids are. And we're talking middle schoolers. Um, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. <laughs> so I, I totally agree with you. I think education um, and making a diverse future workforce is going to be a diverse, a diverse future workforce is going to be really, really important um, to do this well. So I think we're out of time. Thank you so much, Kate. This has been just a wonderful conversation. Um, I guess I want to just turn to the audience now and, um, and wrap things up. So thank you, everyone, for joining this incredible session. Um, I want to thank all of our amazing speakers for their insights, ideas, and wisdom. Uh, I hope you've all found something you can take away from these conversations that inspires you and motivates you uh, as we all work towards building a more equitable future for all. Thank you.